Thank you to the AIBD course directors for the invitation to present and the program coordinators for all of their help. Thank you, Dr. Cross, for your presentation on positioning of therapies. And Dr. Hootsman, thank you for moderating. I'm eager to talk now in regards to novel targets and therapeutic perspectives in inflammatory bowel disease. My name is Anita Avzali. I'm an associate professor of medicine and the medical director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease uh, Center at Columbus, Ohio, Ohio State University. So I titled this talk specifically to be therapies beyond TNF antagonists because unfortunately our current therapy certainly has some limitations. Specifically with anti-TNF agents, we know that 30 to 40% of patients will fail to have a response when they're initiated on therapy. We call these patients primary non-responders. And among these primary non-responders, about 25% of these patients are less likely to respond to an alternate biologic or new or different mechanism of action. And despite this, we also know that about 50% of our patients who are initiated on TNF therapies will lose a response. We call this secondary loss of response. We also know that TNF naive patients tend to do better with an alternate biologic agent as opposed to the TNF exposed patients. And there's other limitations such as cost of therapy, the route of administration, and also side effects. So as I demonstrate here with our current non-TNF therapeutic options, there is a marked difference in treatment response or remission between the TNF naive patients as opposed to the TNF exposed th uh, patients who have received these therapies. So when we evaluate the novel therapies, we should also realize the potential impact of this with our newer therapies in the horizon or in the pipeline. This slide is simply shared to excite all of us in regards to the therapies in the IVD pipeline. And as demonstrated here, the, there are different therapeutic targets and mechanisms of action, and we will review many of these new therapies in the pipeline today. To start, the cytokine interleukin-12, or IL-12, was thought to have a central role in the T-cell-mediated responses of inflammation for over a decade. But more recently, the discovery of interleukin-23, which carries a common P40 subunit, as well as along with the IL-12 that carries that same unit, but this also carries a P19 subunit, which prompted the efforts to determine whether this may also serve a role in being able to control the inflammatory cascade and be able to provide additional therapeutic options. As you know, ustekinumab targets both interleukin 12 and 23, and is approved for both ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's disease. So recently, there has been a therapeutic rationale for targeting these other cytokines and to also explore potential ways in which these therapies can be applied to treat our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Mirakizumab is an interleukin-23 antagonist, and it's studied in patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. These patients were randomized to different doses or placebo and stratified based off of previous exposure to biologic therapy, which consisted of about 60% of the patients. Clinical responders at week 12, as defined here, were then randomly assigned to groups that received maintenance treatment with mirakizumab 200 milligrams subcutaneously at every four weeks or every 12 weeks. The primary endpoint was clinical remission, defined here as a Mayo subscore of zero for rectal bleeding, as well as one point decrease from baseline in the stool frequency and zero or one for endoscopy at week 12. The primary endpoint was not significant with the comparison of the 600 milligram dose of mirakizumab. However, at week 52, and the data is not shared on this slide, but 47% of the patients given sub Q mirakizumab 200 milligrams every four weeks and 37% treated with the every 12 week dosing were in clinical remission. Now, what about another IL-23 antagonist? Well, rizankizumab for Crohn's disease has also been evaluated. Again, patients were randomized to different dose regimens with the primary endpoint at week 12 with ongoing maintenance study as shown here. 
When we look at clinical remission, and this was defined as a CDAI of less than 150 for the pooled rizankizumab group, 30.5% achieved clinical remission. And as far as endoscopic endpoints, for endoscopic response, which was defined as greater than 50% reduction in Crohn's disease endoscopic index score from baseline to week 12, it's about 30%. Endoscopic remission, which was defined as the CDEIS of less than four, it's about 17%. And then for deep remission, which was defined as both clinical remission and endoscopic remission, is 7% at week 12. Gazilkimab is a phase two study of another IL-23 antagonist to evaluate the efficacy and safety compared to both placebo, as well as a comparator of ustekinumab was included here. Week 12 interim analyses was actually recently presented at UEGW for the primary analysis population of the first 250 patients that were enrolled. The primary endpoint was the mean change from baseline and CDAI score at week 12. And as you can see here, gazilkimab at all three doses, 200, 600, and 1200 milligrams intravenous induced clinically meaningful improvements versus placebo in patients with moderately to severe Crohn's disease who had previously failed conventional therapy or were biologic exposed. I'd like to draw your attention to the treatment response on whether these patients were or were not biologic exposed. It doesn't look as markedly different for gazilkimab versus the market reduction that you see for ustekinumab bio naive versus bioexposed. I'd like to say that this is interesting data and certainly more to come with the future of this study. Now here's endoscopic endpoint data as defined below for the different gazilkimab doses. The phase three studies for gazilkimab in Crohn's disease are also currently underway. So what about the safety profile of our IL-12 or IL-1223s? Well, overall, based mostly from solar registry, there does not seem to be an increased risk for infections or malignancies. And although we don't have head-to-head -head safety data yet comparing safety of our different biologic therapies, we certainly do know that the safety profile and that there is a higher risk for infections associated with our TNF antagonists. So we certainly need to put all of this and keep all of this in mind. So now let's switch gears to oral small molecules in the pipeline, and this is in comparison to biologic therapies. Now, as a reminder, our oral small molecules are produced by chemical synthesis and have a very simple structure, unlike our biologics. Therefore, they are not immunogenic compared to that risk of developing antibodies that our biologics have. The inhibition of the JAK kinase or Janus kinase pathway is the first of our oral small molecule options that we have available. And you may already be familiar with tofacitinib, for example, which is the JAK inhibitor or JAK antagonist. JAK inhibitors prevent or block the STAT pathway, which in turn reduces the inflammatory cytokine release. As demonstrated here, there are four different JAK inhibitors, which includes JAK1, JAK2, and 3, as well as tyrosine kinase, or TIC2. And here you can see the differences in the inhibition of signaling based off of selective or general JAK inhibition. Our current concerns or our limitations with our general JAK antagonists or inhibitors, such as tofacitinib, which is approved for ulcerative colitis, is the recent safety data, which came mostly prim and primarily from the rheumatoid arthritis treated patients who were found to have a higher risk for venothromboembolism or PE, as well as all cause mortality when treated with higher doses of tofacitinib. There's also concern for changes in cholesterol, total cholesterol, as well as potential risk for cardiovascular events, as well as herpes zoster. Lupatacinib is a selective JAK1 inhibitor that's studied for both UC and Crohn's disease. Here for ulcerative colitis, the clinical remission at week eight as defined with the adaptive Mayo score as defined here. I'd like to again draw your attention to the biologic exposed versus the bio-naive group, and you can observe the differences in clinical remission. 
Now, similarly, when looking at endoscopic improvement, which is defined as the endoscopic subscore of one or less, again, look at the differences between the bio-naive and bio-exposed groups. Upadacinumab has also been studied and evaluated in Crohn's disease and phase two trial of patients for Crohn's disease treated with this at different dose regimens and able to include data for both clinical remission and endoscopic remission compared to placebo at week 16 with ongoing maintenance trial and evaluation for one year data. Another selective jack is filgotinib, and the selection trial evaluated the safety and the efficacy of filgotinib for both bio-naive and bio-exposed ulcerative colitis patients who were treated with the endoscopic endpoints as well as the bleeding and stool frequency endpoints, e, which is defined as EBS, and here you have the endpoint at week 10 with the maintenance for week 58. Here, Fagotinib, 200 milligrams, demonstrated statistically significant higher proportion of patients achieving clinical remission in both the biologic naive and experienced treatment at week 10 compared to placebo. But again, look at the differences between the bio-naive and bio-exposed, and also Fagotinib at 100 milligrams did not achieve significance at week 10. In the maintenance trial, Fagotinib, 200 milligrams and 100 milligrams achieved the primary endpoint. Now let's switch gears to the anti-trafficking agents. Ozanamod is an oral agonist of the sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor subtypes of 1 and 5 that induces peripheral lymphocyte sequestration, which potentially decreases the number of activated lymphocytes circulating to the gastrointestinal tract and contributing to ongoing or worsening inflammation. In the phase two study, ozanimod for ulcerative colitis treated patients at dose 0.5 or 1 milligrams compared to placebo was studied, and the primary outcome was clinical remission at week eight. In this preliminary trial, ozanimod at a daily dose of 1 milligrams resulted in a slightly higher rate of clinical remission for the ulcerative colitis patients compared to placebo. The trial was not designed or was not large enough to, and, and not stays in a sufficient long duration of time to further establish details on clinical efficacy or to assess further safety. Etrazimod is another oral S1P modulator studied in ulcerative colitis, as, and this is another phase two study. The endpoints are described here, and again, based on this proof of concept trial, etrazimod in ulcerative colitis at a two, a two milligram dosing was more effective than placebo in producing and achieving both clinical and endoscopic improvements. Now, the safety concerns for our S1P modulators includes infection as well as bradyarrhythmia, as well as macular edema has been reported. Now, you're all familiar with vetolizumab, the infusions, which is approved for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Visible One was evaluating the efficacy of subcutaneous vetolizumab for maintenance th therapy in ulcerative colitis. And Visible Two, which the data not shown, is also evaluated for subcutaneous use of vetolizumab for Crohn's disease. Here you can see that patients received induction infusion and then randomized to ongoing infusion or subcutaneous treatment of vetolizumab or placebo. And as demonstrated, vetolizumab subcutaneous was effective for the maintenance therapy compared to placebo or compared to vetolizumab infusions without any risk for loss of efficacy or any additional safety concerns. Lastly, there are mixed results in the clinical trials program for etrolizumab, where some induction and maintenance trials, as listed out here, met some of the endpoints, while others did not. So I would say overall, the jury is still out in regards to the potential role for etrolizumab in treatment of ulcerative colitis. So in summary, the IBD pipeline, it's exciting. There's next steps that we'd certainly now need to determine now more than ever in regards to how do we position our therapies? Which treatments should we select first? In what order? Can we do combination therapy? Do we have potential early biomarkers to predict which of our patients will respond to which of our therapies? Now more than ever, we need to better be able to define what personalized therapy in inflammatory 
bowel disease entails and how we can determine what the right treatment is for each of our patients. So now I'm going to uh, direct this talk to, back to Dr. Hootsman, who will discuss case conference and be able to have additional discussions in regards to these newer therapies.